Hello everyone, today we talk about the Viking long ship. Actually, we'll be talking about uh, cargo ships as well. You know that long ship was essentially synonymous with warship properly meant. This is not even properly a Viking warfare. Yeah, it, it is a, a Viking warfare video, but it doesn't focus on, say, more than the ship's um, structure. Uh, and as such, uh, in fact, it's a very technical one for our series about ancient and medieval um, ships, mostly warships. Uh, and surely we have to catch up with a lot of Viking military history, so this can be an interesting uh, way to um, to do it for today. Um, there, There is really a lot to say in terms of all the various different types of ships that we have found. Uh, in some cases practically intact uh, to our greater joy, so we, we could reconstruct step by step um, the uh, in fact, the, the development, the transformation, even properly the evolution of Viking ships at this point, because naturally the earlier one corresponded to, to an era that was surely much different from uh, 300 years later at the end of the Viking era and um, say monarchies had began to, to appear the fact in Scandinavia there had there had been a, a greater necessity. I made videos about uh, the same uh, Leidang, and so there is, as you know, it's fundamentally the naval levy because, uh, especially in, in certain parts of Scandinavia, essentially most expeditions were so because of the geography, the nature of the places, um, you know, by sea or not much else. Um, that illustrates actually how the mechanism was working and you understand that in a later time and beyond because the Viking era conventionally ends somewhere like 1066 if you want to be dramatic uh, about it but of course the Scandinavians kept doing largely what they did except at that point they shifted um, theater of operations mostly um, but together with the development of the local monarchies you have bigger vessels, larger fleets, because of course for the, as we will see now, the bigger uh, ships um, uh, we um, we have many other um, smaller ones and this is truer in absolute terms, in fact the larger, this, in fact these fleets are and, and so this means in practical terms that there would be less bigger ships in proportion to the to the to the smaller ones, um, uh, in this sense, and the early uh, Viking ships, which is a term we we use Viking just to, as you know, define in the sense an era and an activity and some specifics in the international relations we can call them um, like this through this piracy fundamentally, um, but. This sort of lifestyle had been going on forever. I mean, Scandinavians definitely didn't begin to go by sea um, in the 8th century. Uh, and we have made lots of videos also about Gaelic piracy, also Scandinavian one during the, the migration era. And we made recently some videos also about Germanic ships at the time of the uh, Batavian Revolt, for example. So it was actually a florid maritime activity throughout even the, the early Middle Ages. I made a video about the North Seas um, exactly in that towards the 6th, 7th century. And it's one of the most fascinating times ever, albeit dramatically underdocumented, but still there is something, right, that we will get to um, in depth. Um, in any case, there is a reinforcement of naval activities during the Viking era, for which, of course, the Vikings have become famous in, in, in the same development of these ships. There are a bit uh, like jewels of the north, to say the least, in terms of nautical, uh, naval engineering, uh, nautical capacities um, in general. They fit sort of a, the broader average with, of a, what a warp-like people is able to do when specializing um, in such um, activities and in this case naval uh, warfare, some amphibious warfare uh, and so developing the the organ that uh, allowed them to do that instrumentally. There is a lot of cultural values attached to ships like these men were essentially bec becoming sailors, becoming 
um, see leaders, we could say, having a, a very deep connection with um, with water in their in a symbolic sense, right? Dominating this greater extent of the most tonic dimension to bring, in fact, their their rule, their um, their strength, their power across it, and even being sustained by that. So being able to tame the waves in that in that regard, which is frightening, and um, uh, say especially in this spiritual temper that, as you know, is. Um, in the far north of Europe, quite um, quite dark, even in the Apollonian dimension that, of course, the, the Germanic North world had um, cultivated throughout the years, is much more dominated uh, compared to other cultures by this perennial darkness, like looming uh, over the fate of the hero, right? Um, this, there is this greater awareness of the twilight of, of the gods, the storming of the Asgard, and so uh, this these forces of, of evil are much more e- all evidently around this desperate struggle for survival, and that's where the Viking ship in itself takes up a, a specific um, anthropological, folkloristic, religious meaning. Uh, that is difficult just to summarize in a, in a single video, but in fact, I uh, this is just say the first about Viking warships that I intend to do, hopefully. Um, so the vessels of the Scandinavians in the early part of the Middle Ages um, seem to have been without sails, right? And part of the obvious reason is that they were much less um, arranged than they would have become later. They were smaller, they just were mostly about coastal navigation, not entirely, right? You know that the same, I don't know, think about the Anglo-Saxon conquest of Britain or this other phenomenon had maintained, of course, throughout the ages, these exchanges, these connections. Uh, I made uh, videos about, I don't know, the, the Battle of Brunnenberg, for example, the participation of Norse mercenaries. Um, uh, of course, we are in, Vi- in the Viking era at that point, but essentially, what, you know, how distant are, technically, the Anglo-Saxons from, from the Norse um, in, in that regard. And naturally, yes, there are differences, everything is complex, it's changed in, within the same bridge and also from the same, uh, say, uh, points of departure, right, of the uh, Germanic invaders. But of course, there are very similar peoples in, in many other ways, and so it's all the more remarkable that uh, the hunger, ambition, sort of fantasy of these conquerors would bring to such an extensive phenomena like uh, the Viking one, even if it were just from a geographical point of view, but as you know, say, dealing with, with much more. So that it's difficult even to simply standardize a Viking ship um, for the sake of um, explanation. Today we will try to do it. We'll pick like the heart of the Viking gear, like the mid 9th century. Uh, but observing these other dynamics before and afterwards, so just to trace a trend, right? So sales, of course, were there at some point throughout all um, these people's um, history, but just they were not habitually uh, employed. By the mid-8th century, uh, we start seeing vessels normally kept with sails um, for the simple fact that now the, the Norse were deciding to to need them because they had to, of course, uh, increase the range of their of their voyages uh, in search of plunder, which was basically the the most um, say elementary motivation right behind that. Right, there is much else. Right, but the substratum that remains throughout the entire Viking era is plunder. Right, there would have not been, especially. A slave trade, and uh, it's completely normal. And um, as long as the Viking era lasted, in fact, that's basically the the first mover, All right? Naturally, one has to explain why it began to happen at the time. These were, again, uh, trade routes that had been normally uh, just uh, traveled by by the Norse, right? And just realizing what was happening 
um, in uh, on the continent in Britain in places that had been going through uh, a crisis etc and of course relying on a growing Scandinavian um, demographics um, not necessarily agricultural output of course it was that too in terms of expansion of the cultivated land but the fact that the Norse left Scandinavia was also connected very much with um, with the evidence that it could have uh, lived off of other lands and um, taken that chance to, to populate them to uh, to expand uh, in 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 a way that in Scandinavia would have been limited, right? People mostly throw around the concept of climate change. Yes, it was sort of climate warming at this point, so um, Scandinavians began to survive more, but this doesn't automatically correspond to agricultural output, so there was an imbalance in that, and they had to take the seed to go up. Even if it had happened like that, say, what I, what I love to phrase this like uh, any other you know, human endeavor is that humans can change much more easily their own societies than any other sort of external astronomic factor can can do right throughout their history um, and there is no determinism necessarily about this there were some political reasons people say also religious ones again we do understand however that the Viking uh, era is largely just like essentially the Norse um, correspective of I don't know the Magi or the Saracen invasions in function of uh, the uh, largely sp spontaneous internal collapse of the Carolingian Empire Right, if one really wants to be that harsh, right, a stripping of protagonism, the second invaders. Uh, but it's also quite relevant because, of course, say they were not attracted as magnets just uh, against their will. So, of course, what they were able uh, to put up, and especially the outcome of that, so the, the establishment truly of Christian feudal monarchy is much more powerful than anything that existed at the beginning of the Viking era in Scandinavia is uh, enormous, right? And this is not just because of the uh, still immense uh, for especially their societies of loot that they could grow from a very wide era and especially, uh, you know, the Gaul, Britain, uh, but not only, right? Especially if we look at the east as well. Along the great Rusian rivers, we find Constantinople and uh, her money, the, you know, Barangian military service in there, etc. So um, it's a much bigger deal than we normally think, also because the same Western Europe, continental Europe, was expanding at the same time. And just recently, even talking about Byzantine warfare, etc., we have seen how, um, how of course, um, indistinguishable to some degree the sort of the Viking warrior, and at some point, um, the, the Frankish knight. Uh, become right. This is a very old theme of Schwarzenberg, right? When especially dealing with the roots of chivalry, right? All of Europe basically was soaked into that thing. But the idea of the Northerner, uh, of the Norman later on, which is just a synecdoche. Most of these people were actually um, Frenchmen, Germans, uh, Lombards, Occitanians, etc. Right? So nothing specifically uh, Norse. Right, but in in part of their ancestry, but in the general dynamic that is also very similar to the one of the migration era, telling the truth, and that repeats itself uh, even in the later Middle Ages, like old the Great, for example, a German uh, mercenary companies of the 14th century. It's always the same um, mechanism that, in times of crisis, is triggered again, and we tend to segment this by uh, saying, "Well, it's." First this era, first this other. Again, there had been another, say, Viking era in the same migration era uh, and beyond. But I will leave this for another video. The important thing is realizing that the nautical uh, expertise of these peoples, of course, developed dramatically um, uh, in the quickest way right throughout their history in relative terms, of course during the Viking era, but it was part of a broader context that also kept living on, and largely also doing the same things that we're doing um, during the Viking expedition. Which makes also a lot of sense, especially for countries that do not have much of an interland to expand, like especially the Norwegians, that are in fact like the, the most, um, say, 
exploration bias of of the um, of the Vikings, at least by sea. Um, that's not to say that the Swedes did not go even more far away, but um, it's it, it becomes part of these people's culture as much as the one of other countries, right? Countries like Ireland, for example, right, that ferociously resisted the Viking um, settlement, still owe basically much of their uh, culture, their major cities, um, etc., to to the Viking era, the Norse influence parts of again the the boundaries are always quite interesting to set uh, while debating history. Now we are lucky, of course, regarding the fact of uh, as we were saying before, disposing of a number of ships of the Viking period uh, in many cases discrete uh, states of preservation thus the appearance of the ships is well known right uh, as i often say even when making those videos about arms and armors that it's not much that we cannot of course replicate these um historical artifacts but that with and, and even improving them largely through our engineering that is of course um, insultingly more advanced than anything, of course, they had at the time, but that with, with their means, we are not able, even together with our, um, say, engin engineering understanding, to replicate what they did, right? And especially to, to make that work for what they needed it to work like. Always bear it in mind, right, that all this knowledge is unfortunately lost, we know materially how they're, they were built, but if we were to replicate that with their means, we haven't basically... Like, we have an idea, of course, there are people who do this in a way, but um, to that degree of substantial ergonomy that they were used to, and also, of course, for their employment, that's the same reason you can even replicate a Viking's world, but unfortunately not knowing uh, much about how they were employed to an important opological degree. Right, I, I'm always amazed when people think, well, just you know, you know fighting in the 21st century, a mock combat, um, without the the mentality, the background, or the, the 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 culture of a Viking. How what what's the actual heuristic value of it? How how do you think that 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 makes you understand how they they fought? It, it's in, it, it it's insane to say the least. Um, there are many people who have fun with that. Again, I have no problem with things like reenactment or HEMA per se, but there is an abyss between these worlds and our own. And especially, this is sort of materialistic, technologistic superstition to, to think that just if you know what the material culture is about, you can um, understand what happened. Good luck with that, you know, historically speaking. Um, because we know, of course, dreadfully few, after all, about many aspects, say, the most important aspects of the, of the times in general, right? We know that very few for, I don't know, Carolingian Europe, you can imagine for for Scandinavia. Uh, but of course, we grasp some essentials, some um, generalities that help us a big deal to, of course, uh, visualize um, in our, say, poor cognitive means, right, of the, the actual historical reality that took place and that these magnificent ships are the the testament to. Um, so let's look a bit first of all at what the Viking ship is in form, right? First of all, it's open, right? This may seem like a an obvious statement, but it's it's not too much, especially when you want to reconstruct how naval warfare actually ensued, right? Um, so. There were lots of practical reasons. Um, firstly, the open design allowed for easy boarding and disembarking of the ship, which was crucial for Viking raids and expeditions. The absence of a sealed deck meant that Vikings could quickly jump on and off the ship, making surprise attacks and quick escapes more efficient. We shouldn't overly dramatize this. Yes, at some point, the Vikings did operate, right? There's a very specific phase, especially the initial one, right? When they didn't know where they were going and they were still scattered, not um, coordinated enough, right? But still, in fact, in a, on a smaller 
like um, uh, tactical level that what in part would make the thing. Um, this is true in a sense for again the ships that existed um, among these people before the the Viking era as well. This open design also allowed um, the uh, Vikings to carry larger numbers of warriors on board. Um, this was particularly important during the engagements that basically consisted mostly in a large uh, bombardment with uh, stones and missiles, javelins, arrows, etc. before boarding. Right? And uh, in the sense Viking warfare wasn't that much different from it was it was much more sort of primitive um rudimentary um and muscular right but um as opposed to tactical finesse but let's say not even in Mediterranean it was much about it. basically there were battle uh, lines that interlocked each other and then you know they tried to board each other and it's larger stop there even land battles were way more dynamic tactically uh, than that and we will observe the the cargo dimension as well because some viking ships as you know were provided with uh, lodging for horses that actually had a very uh, very important role in viking warfare that surely was not so equestrianly developed as say the the frankish one but um it still made large use of mounted troops um, during the raids and, and not only. Um, in fact, um, this is another interesting aspect that the open design facilitated the transportation of goods and livestock. Right? This is not specifically what I was referring to just right now about very specific ship's design for carrying horses that sort of evolved uh, at some point, in especially the northern European designs for uh, in the later period, I mean, the, the Scandinavians would do, uh, would go at the Crusades pretty much with the same mechanisms. We'll talk about this kind of um, transportations in, in other, on other occasions. Uh, all peoples had them fundamentally, but they, I mean, the Vikings were absolutely sophisticated enough to um, to specialize, right, uh, the various ships in this way. Um, loot. Right, we talk about goods, livestock, we talk about slaves as well. Of course, uh, these ships uh, had to carry back a lot of wealth, hopefully, which could change a big deal back home. Um, so this was part of the, of the objective. Vikings were traders as well as raiders, and their ships were used for long distance, sometimes multi-year trading voyages. The open design enabled this easy loading and unloading of cargo, including animals, which were often kept on board. We must imagine with very important hygienic precautions, even though, say, throwing stuff overboard is is, is quite convenient, but it still requires work, it requires uh, order, speed, etc., because certain, um, uh, say, aspects of that um, close permanence can even be toxic for humans. Um, ammonia, for example, results after you know the evaporation of urine, which uh, is um, is very dangerous. Uh, additionally, the open design helped with maneuverability and handling of the ship. Viking ships were known for their speed and agility, and the absence of a close deck reduced the weight and allowed for better control in maneuvering the ship, especially in challenging environments like shallow waters, narrow rivers, but also heavy winds. Finally, the open design also played a role in the Viking religious and cultural practices. The Vikings believed in the importance of connecting with the natural elements to an important degree, including the wind, sea, and sky. This is something that had ancestrally remained. It was traditional, right? The, as we were saying before, the um, properly the need to control such powers in order to facilitate the same uh, sailing was... Uh, really, uh, the the deal there, like we can't control the elements through our divine medium. Uh, the open design of the Viking ships allowed uh, the Vikings to have a direct interaction with these elements to some degree and enhancing their connection with the natural world. 
it may sound a bit romantic, uh, but it's still part uh, of the game. Another uh, characteristic form of Viking ships is the clinker built uh, boat, as such. Um, and there, this was also known as the lapstrake construction, and it had several advantages. First of all, uh, strength and durability. The overlapping planks or of clinker construction provided a strong and sturdy hull. The overlapping method ensured that the planks were able to withstand the stresses and strains of harsh seas and rough weather, making the ships more durable. This um, form was also more flexible. Clinker ships were able to flex and adjust to changes in weather and sea conditions. The overlapping planks allowed for some movement and, and um, gave preventing uh, the, the, the ship from being rigid and vulnerable to damage. It's also a light type of construction compared to other shipbuilding methods such as Carvel construction. Clinker 1 resulted in a lighter ship. Uh, this naturally was a method like, used also in later times, right? Um, and it made, uh, in, in their time, the Viking ships more maneuverable and easier to sail, making them efficient for long-distance navigation and raiding. Also in terms of repairs, say in case of damage, the clinker construction made it easier to repair the ships. Individual damaged planks could be replaced or repaired without dismantling an entire ship, which was important during their long and adventurous voyages. Uh, the final, let's say, element um, is the double-ended form, which was really typical of northern seas um, in Europe. And also here we have several uh, reasons, uh, advantages. Uh, first of all, the uh, you understand what it means, right? You have basically uh, the the stern that really looks like uh, the prow, really, and um, this made navigation in a sense more efficient. The, the double end design allowed for improved maneuverability, at least in different water conditions, since the ships could sail either direction without having to turn around. For example, they could easily navigate through uh, narrow rivers, shallow waters, and even sail backward if needed. Um, this made also, Viking ships uh, agile in combat. Um, uh, Viking ships, as you understand, were primarily used when you look at warship for raiding, right? For warfare uh, in general. And so the double ended design provided an advantage as they could quickly change direction and swiftly approach or escape from enemies. It could also launch surprise attacks from both ends, ensuring that the enemy would have a difficult time defending against them. This wouldn't alter really the normal tactical dynamics of uh, uh, naval battles, but still, given that we're talking, as we were saying about, generally speaking, a bit less, um, say, in spite of the extraordinary development of naval warfare during in, at the peak of, of, of the Viking era, still sort of fragmented political realities, um, something more resembled the concept of war band, or also at sea. Um, so there was a greater um, emphasis on the individual compared to more collective uh, dimensions. So that even the ship, to some extent, even though it was always considered to, for, for a collective employment at its finest, had um, um, general capacity to rely on itself um, in say, when it was isolated, etc., Stability and seaworthiness have to do with this design as well. I mean, the symmetrical shape of the ships enabled increased stability. The long, narrow hulls with pointed ends reduced resistance in the water, allowing the ships to sail smoothly, efficiently, even in rough seas. There is also an advantage in beaching and shallow water accession, because um, the double-ended design made it easier to navigate into shallow waters and, and beach the ships. Um, the Vikings often used this to their advantage. Uh, they could quickly land their ships on shore, conduct rides or trade, and then easily launch the ships again without the need for harbors or docking facilities. 
This is particularly important in also as far as amphibious warfare was concerned. Viking ships, as we observed at this point, were equipped with a mast which could be raised and lowered, uh, as of course um, supporting the sail, which uh, allowed the greater propulsion of, of the ship. Um, the uh, we, we see essentially a single square sail, quite simply. Again, that they weren't dramatically. Um, um, refined maneuvers that you could carry out just uh, even in, with, with tactical functionality other than and with the oars. Um, the sail was however important for these um, maritime voyages and they also played an important role as identification uh, devices. Right, They were brightly colored just as the ships by the way um, we see uh, at least more typically the per particolored vertical bands uh, as one of the most simple patterns of course but there could be substantially uh, developed artistic um, representations also because there was some degree of proto-heraldic uh, symbolism right i made a video last year about the 11th century cat shaped shield picture symbolism that is effectively pretty close drawn from the said by the same Bayeux tapestry uh so you know sort of still Norman dimension and we see it the same think about the the Draco in the Anglo Saxon um armies I made a video about the Draco if you are interested. Not for medieval times, only the truth that remained alive um as late as thirteenth century Germany. Um but if you think ab about the Drakkar and so the the symbol the Viking ships were not called Drakkar, uh, they were just um, in the, uh, saying the before the fact that they were in, in part conceived as this sort of uh, sea monsters which uh, take, took up that form and, in terminology but it could be different um, creatures symbolized in that and so there was a great variation and everything had to be that uh, specific, right? This were worlds in which, as you know, not even surnames technically existed in, in the in the sense that we intend, or more like nicknames, because everybody was considered like as a, as a single, as part of a clan, of a stock, uh, etc. But um, as a single shot that had to be evaluated for his own capacities and his own qualities. And again, political fragmentation made the rest in increasing sort of the heterogeneity of this. Um, characterization, this customization, personalization. Um, an important aspect, as we were saying before, are the, we can't point out are the differences between the Viking, uh, Viking warships from the earlier Saxon boats that we will see specifically in another video. Um, the shape of the hull, in particular, is more refined in the Viking ones. Right? Um, there are also proper keels, right, uh, which must have considerably aided the sailing qualities. For the rest, they weren't dramatically different. Again, there was a development taken back to the millennium before Christ. Um, in any case, when we, um, say, tested replicas of Viking vessels, we have seen the degree of, of course, of sophistication reached. Uh, these vessels proved themselves extremely seaworthy, and there is still a lot of, in fact, experimental archaeology connected with these and uh, these reconstructions. That that is, of course, quite interesting, and should always be considered. However, in a broader uh, picture, consider like you could think of land battles, right? What does the knight do? Right in Scandinavia, there is not quite, at least, the knight in which we have modernistically defined a specific type of guy in the high in the late middle ages but it was pretty much the same i mean the the, the hero even in vandal culture as you know it's it's always the guy on horseback the rome's award in search of adventures like in the sagas and um, the later revived germanic epos and so on literally so um, the sense is that these guys roam have their own adventures their own business 
that's what they do. They're essentially mafia bosses that rule this net that has to, of course, uh, become richer, coming back home, trying to install some more powerful uh, regime against what were actually the conventional Scandinavian traditions. I mean, the idea that religious power tended to actually limit religious as political power to limit the rise of one guy above the others. Of course, the Viking raids unhinged this dramatically. That's also why you have a, a massive step further, telling the truth in civilizationally speaking, through it. Um, and th these groups are, of course, well aware of the incredibly brutal, traumatic, miserable, violent, and bloodthirsty uh, life um, that the, the Viking activity entailed. A reason for which the greatest dream of these men would have been to die, of course, um, in a worthy manner, in combat, in order to achieve heaven, right, uh, the Valhalla, which um, were, was, um, in, in that sense, uh, the ultimate proof, of course, of the individual sacrifice. But this would and hopefully happen, not just, again, dying of um, septicemia in, you know, on a, a stranded in, in some obscure beach and eaten up by you know the local fauna afterward, but hopefully dying in one of the major battles um, uh, possible, right? So the great, the, the aggregational dimension of this warfare, just like for, again, the, the typical knight that wants to join the bigger engagement that is played at the top by very powerful people as the ones that, as we've seen, start rising in the same Norse society at this point, thanks to the same Viking activities. Um, and that are the events that, of course, all the uh, all, all the sagas concentrate on, right? The great hero, the great leader, the fi that fights and dies in the great combat, uh, highlighting, again, this spirit of self-sacrifice, but also the... Uh, Say the, the darker aspect of that, because at this point, at least um, the one from which the, say the, we can't start getting the, the sagas to, to an, an adequate degree of understanding also of the mentality, the spirituality of these individuals, is, is a world that, not differently from the rest of the continent, had basically gone beyond the idea of, of possible salvation, or like of self-salvation. Um, there is some hints scattered here and there, even in Beowulf, etc. But there is an idea of fate that basically directs somebody's life and a, basically a superhuman effort uh, in order to, to break it um, and to to achieve uh, more than that. And of course, the, the age of that heroism had even divinely been sort of felt being surpassed. This is, again, something that throughout the millennia had... Um, just sipped in the the world, right? This is not about the Vikings, uh, let's say the Scandinavian Norse uh, of this era, or uh, say any other people specifically. Of course, these the Norse would have been closer to the original concept, say, of awakening of the beast-like fury to tame in order to transfigure and all this stuff. Um, Christianization brought an end um, to this uh, to a significant degree. It didn't. Uh, uh, actually erase it. Um, but of course, passing to feudal monarchy is a bit imperfect, like the, the Scandinavians would have achieved that fully just in, at the end of the Middle Ages, but still that entailed, as we've seen in the same Leidang um, recruitment system, to an increased demilitarization, detachment from actual, say, management of warfare as such. Um, Yes, during the high, the late Middle Ages, an average Scandinavian peasant was surely better acquainted to a sense of um, raiding warfare, etc., compared to other more pacified areas of Europe. But generally speaking, um, this this is a thing that had already come largely to to an end, exactly with the establishment of greater authority at the end of the Viking era. Um, and so this is the the background around which we have to think all these ships at some point gathering, um, hearing of the news of the conflicts of the major leaders, uh, what they could get as a reward, what was at stake really, um, and 
making this dramatic showdown, which, you know, the sea would have turned red uh, in blood, uh, to say the least, and again, with a, with a shocking uh, brutality that is uh, definitely concentrated to that sense of the still, even stereotypically to a degree, but of the guy that especially on, let's say, on, uh, on, a, on a ship deck uh, would have been on foot. Um, also, it could have seen a horseman on a deck. It, surely it happened some, somewhere, sometime in this period. But, um, I'd say more typically, you know, the idea is also why do we have the so-called Danish axes that actually are type of weapon that developed in the Carolingian world, but had a fortune in here. Well, because it's a type of weapon you can't quite use on horseback more than much, given that these guys, especially on uh, at sea, would fight on foot. Um, the idea of, again, going face-to-face in this heroic champion-like um, idea of, of warfare and, you know, trying to open, like, a, a thoracic cha- a cage um, with a with a single double hand axe blow breaking into the same armor but, uh, optimistically as the, the, the greatest type of damage that could be inflicted by the s- significant physical prowess of these guys but especially the the brain set on basically the, the elimination of any trace of human mercy whatsoever um, well makes the thing right you know it, it's the idea again of the hero dying finally but uh, on a mound of corpses, you know, still, uh, still warm and dripping in blood, um, chopped to pieces all around. I mean, that that's what these people crave for: the idea that of of earning their place in heaven, in the firmament, as a sort of limbo, awaiting for the final for, from the Ragnarok and the in fact. Um, uh, the storming of the Asgard that is not necessarily going to so we know of course from the sagas that some uh, some of the Aesir will die um, so it, it, it's still something that makes them up to the fight as they would have always been just by by force politically, military and socially if they were at the head of some powerful clan of, of, of the aristocracy, the, the nobility even for what, how it was say, designed uh, defined and classified there um, exclusively this person's right it, it, it was not an option uh, and there was a very crude selection process in here um, which is also what made again this all the more uh, and that's the reason again why as I made as I explained also in some videos about um, how medieval mercenaries made these guys so um, so prized and praised abroad because um, of course they were poorer but they were more militarized and so they would naturally uh, serve some of the finest um, armies of the time including making part of the, the Byzantine imperial guard as you know and and more and yes physical prowess etc it's, it's never that prevalently because it's always about collective training and major sort of battle dynamics etc but definitely that individualism that warriorism is still very pronounced right made lots of videos about the berserkers the ulthernar um and the uh we explain how they decayed even during this time with the elevation of these leaders even far above that sort of lifestyle which was even just too too dangerous and expressing just the the desperation of these systems to finally find um, a balance, a center, uh, a cohesion. And, and the ships were essentially just a measure of that power. Right? Um, so, um, can we think of an average Viking ship, say, towards the mid-19th, right? Those who rose up the, the Gallic... Uh, rivers up to, I don't know, the Loire up to the Massif Central, etc. Well, could think of the Langskip, first of all, so the warship, right? What, what is called Longship in Norse is equivalent to, to, the, to the military function, right? This would have 16 oars per side, again, on average, right? Each oar would be manned by a couple of men, so there would be 
32 shields uh, belonging to the crew on each gun whale to protect the rowers. This was a system also uh, relevant to just in fact, avoiding taking hits at the height of the main rowing uh, that would have had his ship, his um, shield just next uh, to his side. The, um, the an equivalent of the shield wall right in in, um, in battle. Never think that a shield wall as such had anything to do with anything different from a defensive function, right? Yes, you could, uh, of course, use the shield also offensively, but the function of a shield wall is primarily defensive. It's taking hits, right? It's every every single people that use shields does the same thing, right? But when you have to smash into somebody, you have to do it with your weapon, so it can't just be that. You have to open, you have to charge, you have to do... Lots of interesting things that do require cohesion, but it's not fundamentally about that. People think that shield walls are uh, uh, are a tactic even in the first place. No, it's just what you do when something is arriving at you. Right? You want to, to maintain some degree of cohesion and you end up interlocking the shield just because these are flat. Right? And they do not inspire in this regard much um, sense of individualism, even though uh, of course, among the leaders, especially, but to some degree, to anyone like uh, of these warriors, there was the idea, in fact, of going for defensive rather than just remaining there, because you can't quite maintain that. Um, you can maintain a cohesion, but uh, it's not a shield wall that is going to turn out useful in that offensive phase. That, if anything, you want to break any shield wall in front of you, except those guys that are seeing you charge are charging back, and so it's a bit like the same naval battle, right? You, if you manage to break through, it's okay. Otherwise, you have to pass yourself to counterattack. Um, I mean, with a ship, uh, otherwise you have to pass to counterattack boarding, and so everything is in warfare always offensive in a positive sense. Um, and again, they were very. Um, straining proofs of force um, individually right of course there were complex tactics large armies etc but these were less the norm compared to say a continental context um, it was sort of less collective training for that that's why they compensated with individual training that is worse um, as a solution but if it's on the only thing that because of the lack of a more concentrated authority uh, you can't afford, well, that still will have to do. Um, so the steersman on the Viking ship controls the steering oar on the starboard side of the vessel. At the front of the boat, um, the say the, the rear of a boat, more curved than with the Saxon ship, terminated um, uh, in a dragon's head, usually. Or a dragon, we say dragon, but actually there were different meanings connected with this. Yes, they were mostly this sort of less, um, say, more chthonic uh, figures. Part of the darkness we were talking about uh, connected with the same sea. Um, but there was... Um, like the griffin, for example, uh, an intent, uh, say a transfigurational in intent of that, and so these monsters were sort of ridden. It's as if again the the chieftain uh, that uh, owned the, the the ship had been the guy riding this dragon, right, and so taming him, and so the guy was, of course, a divine medium of some sort because he knew how to master that. The blood of the dragon, the initiatic rite, slaying the dragon within you, it's all the same story, right? From the sagas, from ancient myths, and more. Um, now, the oars um, appear through ports in the hull instead over the gunwale, giving higher freeboard. The gunwale would be the upper edge of a ship's or boat size, again, where the, the shields also were hanged. This would naturally also increase the distance between the water and the working deck of the vessel. The purpose was essentially towering over the enemy vessels, but this required, again, larger ships. And so, at some point, prohibitive, prohibitive costs, and as we will see now, there was a hierarchy of 
sort of vessels, uh, depending, of course, on the power of the leaders that were expected, in fact, also to perform more uh, in combat, just like the the tougher guy would do because of his qualities in on, on land, right, uh, individually. So the long ships varied considerably in size. The largest recorded, famously enough, are a vessel of Olaf Tryggvason, that is uh, the king of Norway, um, between 995 and 1000 AD. This was called this ship was called the Long Serpent, right? A long or great serpent which had a keel length of more than 37 meters and an, an overall length of about more than 45. Um, a ship of the King Canute the Great, as you know, King of Denmark, King of England, of Norway as well, I mean, the, the greatest ruler uh, by power in the Viking era, had 60 rowing benches. Unless, because the sources sometimes are complex to decipher, this means 30 per side. Uh, we toyed a bit with these numbers also for in the video about the, uh, the the navy, factually, of the Kingdom of the Isles. So you can check that out if you're interested as well. Uh, this would require, in um, in the fact, lo longest size, in fact, a length of essentially 60 meters. The aforementioned Long Serpent of Olaf Trigavason had 8 men per half room and 30 extras, so this essentially makes the ship the equivalent of an Hellenic or, or, or Roman 8, let's say, and her crew total minimum 574. So a massive beast, but consider that this was the exception, and a hell of an exception. Uh, the vessel um, we thought of before, like with 16 um, rows, etc., would have been sort of more typical. Naturally, there was a great deal of customization, personalization, the ship building. There was equally, uh, relative terms, uh, a level of uniformation and even standardization, um, especially when, of course, there were um, rulers that were capable of, say, uh, commissioning multiple vessels at a time by a single um, ship master, ship builder. Um, of course, m most armies were put together, as we've seen from uh, pretty far away. Uh, ships uh, that were not, of course, belonging to a single leader, nor were built, of course, with it by the same guys. Um, but as basically any manufacturer of the time, every ship had its own personality, its own uniqueness. That's also why at least the biggest ones are known to have had these important names, like Long Serpent slash Great Serpent, or um, Thief, Surf, a surf dragon, fjord elk, ocean striding, striding bison, et similia. This is just uh, the same for, I don't know, particularly large artillery pieces in the later Middle Ages. We know that they were sort of unique in their own kind, that for each of them there were lots of smaller ones that probably also had their names, but um, were, uh, were less relevant, like they, they didn't arrive to us. Um, and that uh, were, of course, remembered in, in this fashion because of their exceptionality, like they passed down to history it's because of that reason. And we can imagine, in fact, the largest Viking ships that have been, as we've seen, pretty impressive with several hundreds of warriors on board and so capable of unloading a hell of a, of a storm um, on the enemy's decks. Naturally, the bigger the ship, also the taller it could be, so it could dominate in this especially preparatory phase in which they bombarded each other with uh, different projectiles and uh, then launching uh, the attack and or, you know, maybe wanting to, of course, to close in um, and boarding as fast as possible because, say, maybe they were less provided with missile but still risking it coming close to a also 
more loaded ship before they they had thrown uh, all those projectiles. So everything was really um, calibrated, and we can imagine, especially in the larger engagements, the odds being balanced. Um, and this was more or less the, the type of of clash. Um, it was more difficult, of course, to storm literally by boarding the biggest vessel that also had more force and capability in that sense to pull out of the engagement in theory but in practice as it happened since time immemorable especially in these cultures that uh, at least initially were less um, let's say stratified the leader had always to be in the front right and therefore having also less possibility of getting away uh, that's why, was, as we've seen also in the Battle of Argentoratum, um, in the in the fourth century, the the Alamannic uh, warriors um, taunted at the nobility on horseback to dis, to dis, in order for them to daughter to dismount and fighting alongside with them not to retreat. Right. Um, so we're living quite mixed times in the Viking era because, as we've seen, there is some just by the the temper of time some essentially proto-feudalization of some sort already. Um, all these peoples had the same beliefs, um, ideally, of chivalry, right, that brought even to this, um, you know, in fact, ideals of, uh, of combat. And in, in many ways, the, the, the tro- say, the, the leaders were forced, together with the other troops, to carry out practically the same, uh, the same type of tactics, really, uh, they were also more logical and functional, right? But the concept that somebody could escape more quickly if provided with uh, the right means was still alive there. And of course, even in ter- especially in these contexts that, again, so very fast rises as much as fast falls of leaders due to the, again, unstratified, um, generally unstratified situation and as a consequence, the, the difficulty in concentrated power here and there for a long time would make, in fact, the fortune of the leader, right? If you don't have many other means to prove your greatness, being just a more courageous individual, having proven your your contempt for uh, for risk in battle, at least to, to a degree that would turn out to be successful uh, in the same, was just... Um, a gold standard. Think about Harold or Tarada, who was like, I don't know, I think 14, 15, already having uh, a pretty uh, thick retinue and being like two meters tall. Like, these are the kind of people that lived by then, for not talking just about, of course, his personal curriculum as a soldier in the Mediterranean and back to the north or in the east. As we were seeing at the beginning, the longship, the longship was not the only type of Viking vessel. There were also merchant ships, trade ships known as kraup skips. Uh, the merchant ones known as gnars, um, and it was in these sh- uh, types of ships, not warships, that the uh, voyages of exploration and colonization were mostly undertaken. Of course, there was. Um, yeah, I mean it's obvious. I mean there was a s- civilian military doesn't really apply to these societies as a distinction because of course there is tendentionally, but uh, exploration was also violent, uh, just by for practical as obvious reasons. Um, but of course, depending on the type of operation and the tactical challenges and also the the distance from. Um, you know, from the modern, I mean, we can think, I don't know, those who colonized the White Sea, what kind of, you know, which king would have sent a warship uh, fleet up there, right, for which strategical purpose? Of course, the most convenient places were around, in, in the Baltic, in the North Sea, etc. Um, but, of course, the warships were accompanied by the uh, the cargoes as well, right? And so, the two things were sort of coupled in some ways. The the Gnar was more solidly constructed than a warship with higher sides and greater beam in relation to length, maybe 3.5 to 1. 
Um, this, because it required sort of less agility, and so it could be bulkier, a bit like, as we've seen, the Vanity ships um, of Dario Ritum uh, in Caesar's times, um, that were also, in fact, used for warfare. Right? The interesting thing is that, however, even the Nars preserved the same general method of construction and appearance. So, um, to some extent, depending on certain uh, certain ships, it would have been even difficult to tactically distinguish, in fact, a warship from uh, a merchant one. Um, and this is absolutely normal. It's a bit like uh, with the galleys in the Mediterranean. In any case, those who uh, fared uh, these seas in this play were, were always armed to some extent. They always feared piracy, because that's what, again, the Vikings were about, um, and so everything got blended in between pretty easily. If we were, again, to um, think of a good, like, Viking landscape, we could, can think of um, the aforementioned 60, uh, 16 rows type. Right, this would have had uh, a total of 64 rowers plus other 10, 11 men, so for a total of 75 that would all essentially take on the function of fighters in case of need, but that practically were like a typical mid 9th century landscape. The size of this ship would have been something like more than 23 meters in length, um, more than 5. Uh, the beam, like 70 centimeters of draft, right? Um, the height of the mast could be up almost 13 meters on average. And this is the, again, the sort of Viking landscape mule type, right? Uh, the, the one, the, the rank and file, we can say, uh, the uh, Viking warship. And uh, it would have been the the best compromise uh, at that point, aside from the the monster ones that we mentioned before as the most convenient sort of type of ship. There, there is always, a again, a degree of functionality in the sense that I was explaining before in the relative uh, dimension, like it would have, let's say, the larger the ship, the, the, the fleet. Maybe the bigger the ships that you can find, uh, you could find within it, but in proportion, they would have been tendentially less than the the average ones, and even the smaller ones, of course. So, uh, the bigger ships need the smaller ones to operate, and there would have not been a bigger ship like if there hadn't been enough following retinue for these Viking leaders, in fact, to to bring at sea against their enemies. So th this is fundamentally uh, the concept of it all. It always makes sense. It's the same exactly when these guys landed, right? The guys from the bigger ships were also, also, tendentially the, the the most elite forces. Not overall, because if you count that I don't know six hundred type of six hundred men on these monster ships, of course some of them would have been truly rank and file soldiers, not the some toughest and roughest first cars of the situation. But you can't bet that they would, have, they would have been on that boat in the first place. And so when even when they landed, uh, sort of big snout formation, the concept that there is, uh, it's not quite a geometrical thing per se, but it's the idea that there, there is a section of the line, the central one, the, the one that holds the greatest blow, because the enemy deploys basically in the same way, even when they are different peoples. Um, is in between the, the extremes. It's the one that has to charge first and try to bear, break first, because that's basically what the entire, even the competition among these various leaders that are the head of the various war bands, the various units, are really doing for their entire life. And you can bet everything that, it, you know, when you look at these battles, that throughout the course of these guys' lives, men from the same army would have killed one another for all kinds of feuds, um, vendettas, etc. So um, it was that messed up, but it was that sort of forge of warriors for which we 
of course think of the Viking era like. Uh, it would be really a lot to, to tell um, regarding again the evolution of the designs etc but we should make a video about the single ships that I think ship types uh, types of landscape that would be quite um, useful to a degree we do not know accessible like more say so the important thing in this video is, is the degree of conceptualization that allows you not to stop to the single ship as a piece uh, of of matter but um, what that was designed for what, what by whom was that operated and for which purpose reason uh, objective uh, etc so in belief system etc that's the most important thing of all when you study this um, and so there are definitely impressive uh, engagements as, uh, uh, as well which you can see how even simple at the end of the day even the, the largest battles really were and we'll hopefully get there right I realized that other channels especially the ones about medieval warfare at Similia tend to focus on battles because um, they are the most dynamic sort of scenographic things but uh, say at least the way I'm told um, I was told at this point uh, military history and I also teach uh, now so that I teach it myself uh, learning more about this stuff every day is um, is necessarily uh, substantiated by this apparent background but that actually made the most of the whole thing right so understanding the same ship structure like we did today in part at least cannot go but in parallel with the other sort of political social considerations within the same military one uh, so think about the men uh, not not the ship before um, even if of course that sounds cool in a we wouldn't like to be on a viking ship but let's say the the sense is that of course it, it's you being there even even if you wouldn't know what to do with that today but that's the point right trying to imagine how this experience really was which was also like i don't know crossing the north sea with such ships it's not just like a simple journey right they would of course do it on a regular basis but uh, it's just something that can go wrong in so many ways like not just the journey itself but what's going to happen to the other side you are really depending on these ships there's a sort of alter ego of course of the leader of the this as it's been this sort of guiding spirit by the animal the monster the creature that the same ship really w was conceived to be um, Viking funerals in grand style for the greatest warriors of course had uh, this this idea that the, uh, the mortal spoils went uh, in the bowels of the sea to, with this monster uh, and uh, like whereas the the fire would purify, would bring the soul um, to the Valhalla, and that uh, also stresses like the sort of the, the the tension, the divide, the spiritual load of these individuals, and so their acquaintance with the the extremes of life and death, um, and so what for what this meant for them and in, in the intricate sort of labyrinth of the universe and of existence and of this eternal journey that quite never ended right that that's uh we can't imagine i mean these vikings while dying truly knowing to be still on their ships still knowing that they were navigating to the the greatest the most terrible and um and but most beautiful at the same time journey of all um and you can appreciate this in a world that, of course, it's, um, say it's less documented than other years, but we understand that, of course, the, the Scandinavians were, uh, what I always say about these peoples gravitating around the, the bigger empires, is that they, they knew much more than we think, um, and surely much more than proportion than the other guys, than what, in fact, the guys that were living softer, 
lives and had more means to materially stop even at the end of the day these invaders uh, knew about them and so as obscure as they are for us because uh, they don't they, they didn't write to the extent that allows the same degree of documentation of other peoples uh, at some point and there are parts of Europe that are even less um, mute um, for that reason well they still were there and so they still were known they still were in fact, becoming even the norm, and, and through these critical times, as part of the broader Christendom, as part of the broader, um, uh, the broader European civilization. I made multiple videos about medieval Scandinavia and Scandinavian warfare. So, if you're interested in that, you can always check out the playlist. They don't happen too often because the the way I, well, it's not the way I calibrated the cycle for the random choice, but generally speaking, yes, they're, they are fascinating, they're culturally impacting, etc., but in, in the pop world, but of course there is also less um, to know about um, for how enormous uh, that still is, right? We still have to go pretty much in depth with so much Scandinavian. So in fact, I'm frustrated a bit that we talk about it so few, but again, um, if we don't do it now, we'll do it later, hopefully, and so for today I actually stop it here um, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye <laughs>